an interview with Bradley Pope, and uh, why don't you start by telling us about, about before you were born and your family history and uh, how uh, they got to America and then down to um, Cherokee County and Ackworth. Right. Well, as you've said, the last name is Pope. And uh, in my young life growing up, uh, going to family reunions, I always heard that our great-great-grandfather was born on a ship coming over from Holland, that we were black Dutch. And I accepted that until my adult life. And it dawned on me one day that my great-great-grandfather, who's buried in the Oak Grove Cemetery, his name is Henry Wilson Pope. And I thought, that's about as English as you can get. Where did the Dutch come in? And then I found out that in the main library in Canton was a uh, genealogy booklet done by a distant relative that I never met, never knew of, from Texas, uh, Jennings Bland Pope. He did it in 1979. I went to the library, looked at the book, and copied it, and found out that the name really was Pabst, P-A-B-S-T. We came from Germany. Uh, didn't even slow down in Holland or anywhere like that. Mm -hmm. Came into Pennsylvania, and uh, the name was anglicized to Pope. And at some point, a few generations later, the family came down probably through the uh, old Pioneer Road down through Virginia to Catawba County, North Carolina, and then into Cherokee County, Georgia, and ultimately some of the folks went on into uh, Alabama and Texas. Hence, uh, that's the reason Dr. Jennings Bland Pope wound up in Texas, his family. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, and I, as we were talking uh, before we got started today, uh, my ancestors were Scotch-Irish, but they have a very similar history of um, going through Pennsylvania right. and down the Great Valley of Virginia and into North Carolina and then across into Tennessee in their cases, uh, whereas yours went around the mountain, I guess, into into North Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, so <clears throat> it's an American story, I think. Uh, and changing names uh, is an American story, too. I think that yes. a lot of people mm -hmm. have done that over the years. But you may be connected to the Paps Blue Ribbon, uh, the beer folks. Well, <laughs> there is a rumor. I don't remember if it's in that booklet or not that one branch of the Paps family from Pennsylvania did go into the Midwest and, and became the Paps Brewing company, but okay. I, I can't confirm that. Okay. Maybe I've got a rich uncle somewhere, who knows? <laughs> Probably so. Well, uh, you, uh, you grew up in Ackworth. How did they get to Ackworth? Why did they come to Ackworth? Well, uh, the family settled in the Oak Grove community, uh, South Cherokee County, and uh, before I was born, uh, my mother and dad lived in the city of Ackworth. Uh, let me kind of set the area for you where Crane, Crane's ha taxidermy is located. Um, I think Mac Turner's made reference to where he lived just west of, of Crane's taxidermy. Uh, the Cowan Road Improvement Project took all, took all that out. Mm -hmm. That's where we lived, my parents lived when I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first memory of life was in that house and I guess maybe it was the, the traumatic or the shock value of it, there was a knock at the door one day. Uh -huh. My mother went to the door, and there was a hobo from the railroad who wanted some food and water. And for some reason, that scared me, and I went, I hid under the bed. But that's my first memory of where we lived in Ackworth. And I really don't know why my parents lived there, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, it was just... What was your father doing for a living? He was a plumber. Okay. During the course of his career, he worked for uh, Mr. Kirk Jolly here in Ackworth, Mr. Olin McRae, and uh, ultimately his final plumbing job was with Bill Weeks uh, in Kennesaw. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if they worked in the textile mill. I think he might have briefly done that after uh, his World War II service, okay. and I think my mother did briefly until the family started growing. Well, talk a little bit about growing up in Ackworth. Okay. Spring Street, again, which is just the first street east of where Crane's taxidermy is now. 
Uh, I've already referenced us, the house we lived in, which I think was a rental house. And my dad built a small house on Spring Street. That house is still there, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's a little overgrown, I think, from the last time I saw it. He built a house on Spring Street. And many, many memories there growing up. Uh, playing with Mac Turner, Ralph McNicken, Stanley Burnett, and a lot of those uh, friends playing in the woods. Mm -hmm. It was still kind of rural out there on Spring Street at the time. So uh, we had a lot of fun playing on what we call the Red Hill. There's an apartment complex there now. Mm -hmm. uh, Cowboys and Indians, I remember all of us, we had our stick, uh, mop and broom, ponies and played cowboys and Indians all the time. Wow. So, so what was Mac Turner really like in those days? Um, okay, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to throw you under the bus or under the horse. <laughs> <laughs> we would gather up on the Red Hill, uh -huh. and sometimes we'd play ball, but mostly it was cowboys and Indians, and we had, as I said, our stick horses, and we would decide which cowboys we were going to be. At that time, it was Roy Rogers, Hopalong Cassidy, Lash LaRue, mm -hmm. those folks. And it always seemed that Mac's, uh, Mac was the uh, was the main cowboy, the Roy Rogers type. Okay. <laughs> he always got to choose first. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we had fun. It, it was great. Mm -hmm. All kinds of memories from Spring Street. Now, you said uh, earlier, before we got started, you were born in 48? Yes, sir. So we're talking... Late 40s, early 50s. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, right about the time the lake was coming, did you ever go to the lake and play there? Uh, not much at all. That brings about another interesting story. Why I pretty much avoided the lake all of my life mm -hmm. is when we lived on Spring Street, at one point we had my, a uh, first cousin who was already married and her husband moved in next door to us. Spring Street again was dead end wooded area with the creek uh -huh. down there and my cousin's husband he dug out a swimming hole so we were all anxious when he would get the swimming hole finished sure enough we went down there the day it was ready he waded out waist deep and then he looked at me and he said Bradley come on in so I did trusting him completely and I made it just a few few steps from the bank, I guess, and stepped off in a hole or deep end or something and went down. And I can tell you what that water looked like mm -hmm. under the water to this day, gasping for breath. So it's true, your first experience with water will set the stage the rest of your life. So I never was really interested in doing too much around the lake, doing water, but I did later join the Navy. <laughs> well, I was going to say, that's a little unusual Odd. that you would have gone into the yeah. Navy. Yeah, yeah. So. So you uh, didn't know how to swim, obviously, at that time. I later learned to swim, of course, but uh -huh. just for survival okay. purposes. It could be a pretty big shock, I would say. Yeah. So, well, uh, so uh, well, you go to Ackworth Elementary I School? I did. And talk about that. Ackworth Elementary was great. I went from the first to the fourth grade. A lot of great friends, uh, great, great teachers. I really enjoyed Ackworth Elementary School, and the memories I have of that period of time was field trips. I remember one field trip. We walked actually over from the school to the Ackworth uh, Depot, caught a train, passenger train to Cartersville, toured the Coca-Cola plant, bottling plant in Cartersville, and came back with the buses. So we had a, that was a great field trip, my first time on a train. And I remember, I guess I learned to really love and appreciate baseball. Uh, at Ackworth Elementary School because at recess we would go out and of course Ackworth Elementary was next to the high school and Coach Matthews would come out a lot of times and uh, we'd play ball. Mm -hmm. He coached us. I didn't know much <laughs> to begin with of course. I learned a lot but I really I really had fun learning from Coach Matthews on, on the flats at the uh, elementary school mm -hmm. and playing with all, the, all my friends there. Favorite position? Uh, well, it would have to be one of the bases, whatever base they want to put me on, because I didn't have the arm to play the outfield uh -huh. <laughs> at all. So, uh, 
Mac the pitcher? <laughs> I don't remember. No, Mac was a little older than me. Oh, okay. uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. He was he was ahead of me in school. Okay. So I don't remember uh, playing with Mac. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, uh, so uh, you, you, did you go downtown for fun, or were you too young oh, yes. to be going there on your no, own? No, Ack Ackworth was the shopping place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, even later when we moved out into South Cherokee County, Ackworth was, again, the place to come shopping. And, and I remember uh, in a previous interview you did with someone, they talked about Allen's 5 and 10 cent store, and one side being household goods and one side was toys. Well, that's where I hung out. I'd walk and look at the toys. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember the Silver Trolley uh, restaurant, I guess, is what you would call it. I remember the downtown theater. I remember uh, the drive-in theater. So Ackworth had a lot of things going for it at the time. I, and of course, I used to go in Green's uh, department store also and look around at the toys. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just asking in passing, uh, I, you know, this is the late 40s, the 50s we're talking mm -hmm. about, but did you ever go across the tracks? So, African-American community, any any connection at all with them back then? No, I, I, never did, I never did go over there, but I do remember uh, at some point when we lived on Spring Street, I believe Dad worked with an African-American gentleman who might have helped with some plumbing. I'm, I'm just not sure about that. Mm -hmm. But thank you for asking. I think that's really important for people to understand that yeah, we grew up in the rural South, and uh, but I guess the best way I can say this is we were just not taught any racist issues at all. I mean, they were, uh, we were all part of one community. Mm -hmm. Sure, they had their section of town, and uh, it's just the way it was at the time, but we just didn't have any, any issues at all, mm -hmm. including later when I went to North Cobb High School, my first year at North Cobb, uh, it was all white, mm -hmm. and later uh, it, it was integrated, and, and everybody, yeah, everybody were, just got along you fine. Were graduating right on the cusp of integration. Yes. In yeah. School system. Exactly. Yeah. I think '65 uh, maybe the first. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, very few black students when you graduated, and all, and none when you started. Correct. Yeah, but there were just no issues. I mean, it was just okay. seamless. Yeah. So basically, it wasn't really something that was in your mind in, in that time. Right, exactly. Very little contact, it sounds like, from what you're saying, but not something that you're getting agitated about all the time. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty common experience from those years. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit older than you, but that certainly was my experience growing up in East Tennessee also. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, uh, your family decides to move a few miles away to South Cherokee County, and so you're going to be in the Cherokee County school system for the fifth grade. Why, why did you move um, away? Was he still in the plumbing business? He was so, still in the plumbing business. Uh, dad, dad was, and uh, the family was growing. So again, we had the small house on Spring Street, mm -hmm. and I remember Dad talking to his sister, who was widowed, and her children were all grown and away. She had uh, a mini farm in South Cherokee County, mm -hmm. just I off mean, 92 uh, Highway, and uh, 26 acres, okay. farmhouse, barn, and so they essentially. She needed a smaller place, and there was a real estate transaction where she moved into the house on Spring Street by herself, and we went out to the uh, to the mini farm mm -hmm. in South Cherokee County, 26 acres, and I remember helping my dad uh, fence it in so we could have some cows. Uh -huh. We had some livestock. And, well, it sounds uh, very idyllic, yeah. uh, at least to begin with. To begin with, you're right. To live yeah. in a, a mm -hmm. rural area like that. Yeah. Okay, well, your father sounds like a very admirable person to me, um, um, World War II veteran. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about what happens to um, change him and also change you for a while? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, there's a sense of closure by you asking that question and me responding. Uh, life was good through the first four years here in Ackworth, the first four uh, years through ele elementary school, then moving to South Cherokee County on the mini farm, going to Oak Grove Elementary School until the eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, Dad worked for uh, Mr. Bill Weeks Plumbing Company in Kennesaw. He started exhibiting some physical symptoms that we just didn't understand. He would lose his voice. He would lose his balance. And uh, obviously the doctor that he went to initially was Dr. Caldwell who did everything he could for him. He progressively got worse, totally just wouldn't talk, wouldn't speak, losing weight, losing hair. And uh, Dr. Caldwell referred him to specialists who later referred him to the VA. And because Dad was a combat soldier in World War II, he was with a tank destroyer battalion, and at one point they were attached to the division that liberated Dachau concentration camp. As it progressed, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> as it progressed, uh, Dad really just became kind of unre unresponsive. He would just sit around, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't talk, couldn't talk. And as I said, he lost weight, lost hair. His eyes began to kind of had sunken eyes. And uh, the best we could say is it was he, he just had a moral dilemma of some kind. He was, uh, when he was healthy, he was uh, a deacon and a song leader in our church, Oak Grove Church in South Cherokee County. And I'll never forget the day that Bill Weeks came to our house in South Cherokee County and talked to my mother and told her that he was going to have to let Dad go because he would give him a job and then later, hours later, go check on him and he would just sit, be sitting there staring off into yeah. the distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, tears came to Mr. Weeks' eyes. He didn't want to do that. He hated to do it, but he had no choice. So... Um, Dad, he couldn't work. Then it, all of it fell on mother. There were six of us kids, and times really, really became hard financially and difficult for her and trying to get treatment for dad in and out of the hospital. So we, uh, we had to move around quite a bit, trying to find it. We, we, we lost the 26-acre farm. And then it was from house to house to house as best as mother could do to take care of us. Mm -hmm. So, did she go to work pardon me? Did she go to work? She, she did work briefly uh, as a, uh, what do they call them, a nurse's aide at Kennestone Hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she tried, but it was just too much, really. It's hard to do that and yeah. have all those kids. Exactly. To take care of too. Yeah, exactly. And where I want to go with this now is. North Cobb High School. Mm -hmm. I, I went to North Cobb High School, and this, because of my dad's condition, the condition at home, and the living conditions, it was really, really tough. And so I became a different person. Um, I don't really know how to explain myself exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe unfriendly, uh, standoffish, if you will. Mm -hmm. Had a few friends, but I couldn't, I couldn't really feel comfortable uh, like I had been previously with my friends in Ackworth mm -hmm. when I went to Ackworth Elementary School. So, well, they had to notice the difference. Oh, I'm sure they did. And that's the reason I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity. I, maybe people will understand that from elementary school to high school, I was, I was two different people, mm -hmm. really. And uh, they probably didn't understand why or the change or the reason. Mm -hmm. So... And you said before we got started, I think we ought to put it on the interview, that your father, at, in the end, looked like a concentration camp inmate. Right. I had indicated earlier that he, uh, he was with the, the unit that, um, the division mm -hmm. that liberated Dachau. He, Dad passed in 1969. He was 48 years old, or just a few months short of being 48 years old. And 
he actually looked like he came out of a concentration camp. Again, sunken eyes, thousand yard stare, hadn't talked in a long time. And uh, years later, when I started going to his Army company reunions, and I, I've seen the documentaries, but then I talked to these veterans who were there. They remember the warm ovens. They remember the smell. They remember the, the cattle cars of bodies and the bodies stacked up. And that's what got to my dad. He never got a physical scratch on him after 180 days of combat. It was mental. It was a soul injury. Being a deacon and a song leader in his church, there was this moral dilemma with what he had lived through and what he believed mm-hmm. should be right. And yet they liberated the inmates from the concentration camp. Correct. Yeah. Yes. But just seeing it yeah. was shocking, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I, I later realized, uh, as you can imagine, that, that certainly that had some impact on me and, and my siblings and mom because, uh, you know, we had a form of PTSD too, and that mm-hmm. I think manifested itself with me when I was at North Cobb High School. Talk about Edward Tech and his book and how it affected you. Thank you. Uh, I read a book not long ago because a cousin of mine who was a teacher in North Carolina, he called and asked about his dad who also suffered from PTSD and he wanted to know, did I know anything about his dad, his, his military service in World War II and I didn't. And that cousin gave me a book. It's called War and the Soul by Dr. Edwin Tick. I read that book, and it was such a relief. It was uh, eye-opening as to what PTSD really is as it relates to a soul injury. It's not a mental injury. And uh, as I told you earlier, next to the Bible, that's the second best book I've ever read. I gave it to my brother who read it, and he loves World War II history, and he read that book, and he said, he laughed, and we both laughed, and he said, so that's what's wrong with us. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it was for a period of time. So uh, if anybody knows anyone uh, who's been in combat, uh, well, I say it doesn't have to be military. It could be law enforcement or a job, uh, a hospital, mm-hmm. medical profession, mm-hmm. and and. They have um, soul issues like that. Mm-hmm. that well, police, they have oh, the absolutely, absolutely, sure do. With the things they see and do, it's hard to, a hard form to of combat. When you go home, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, well, when did you get back to being the old Brad Pope? Well, that's another great question that you're asking me. When I graduated North Cobb High School, and as I just said. There were two different people there, and I'm sure people saw it, from elementary to high school. When I graduated high school, I wanted to go in the Navy, but I didn't have an opportunity because I was the oldest son in the family of six, and I needed to help mom. So I kind of dabbled with some career ideas and uh, just had one of those moments when I, re- I said, okay, you can't continue like this. You have got to do better. You've got to make something of yourself for the family name, for dad, for brothers, sisters, and everybody. And I look back on my early years in Ackworth, growing up on Spring Street with all those friends, Mac and all those folks playing cowboys and Indians and what a good time and I look back on Ackworth Elementary days the friends I had you know playing at recess and in school and the school events and I thought about those some of the great teachers Mm -hmm. that I had at Ackworth Elementary School I had those at Oak Grove but still uh, I was looking back at the Ackworth formative years and I looked at the the community the, uh, the business people in town and how successful they were and how nice and kind they were. And I know they had to have helped my mom somewhere along the way. It was just that type of community mm-hmm. where maybe in, in growing up, I didn't realize exactly what they did or how they helped, but I'm, I'm, I know they did. And they did it quietly without fanfare 
without any uh, big pats on the back or anything. It was just the thing to do. That was Ackworth. And so I looked back on that, and I thought, okay, that's my springboard. That's my springboard. Forget about these bad years uh, where I was having a pity party, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so then I started a career and had uh, a lot of adventures, both in law enforcement, and uh, later I was able to join the uh, Navy Reserve. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, I had a lot of adventures in both of those. <clears throat> didn't have to worry about the draft when you got out of high school? Well, <laughs> okay. The draft, they had the draft. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was called down for my physical in Ponce de Leon in, in Atlanta. And uh, I filled out all the form, and I knew Vietnam was going on. Mm -hmm. And I had friends from North Cobb High School who were being drafted, and I had friends who were joining the military. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, my dad did it, my friends are doing it, if I'm drafted, I'll go. Strangest thing, I went down for my physical, and when uh, when I got my report back, it said I was classified as one Y. One Y. One Y. And, and I, that? I thought, well, I'm not one A, and I'm not four F, because I had no no real issues. No, I never heard of one Y. And I looked it up, and one Y was that I was eligible for the for military service in case of war or national emergency. And I thought, we're in the middle of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Why? And I never, I never received another call. <laughs> well, maybe so, they knew you were taking care of, you know, helping your mother, taking care of the family. They may have, but I don't know how they found out because I didn't disclose that. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't fill out any paperwork that would defer me or anything like that. So. I wonder if they defined war, uh, declared war, which it wasn't. It must have. It's the only thing I could, the only thing I could figure. Wow. So, um, uh, well, that had to be a relief, I guess, at that time. Uh, a little bit of relief and a disappointment too, okay. because I, because of my dad's condition, there was a, always ingrained in me just an obligation. Uh, and I thought I had passed the, that opportunity because I didn't get drafted, mm -hmm. until later I found an opportunity to get into the Navy Reserve along with my career in law enforcement. So you go immediately into law enforcement at that point? Uh, pretty much. There was about a, a, a two-year period there where I tried a few things and none of them just okay. just worked out. What was it that attracted you to law enforcement? Uh, honestly, <laughs> uh, steady work, okay. for one. It's always a demand, isn't it? Yeah, always. Yep. Uh, so how did that come about? Uh, you, you applied to Cobb County Police I did. Department? I did. I applied with Cobb County Police Department and was selected. I went to work in 1970 mm -hmm. uh, with Cobb County Police Department and uh, started out as a patrol officer, later uh, detective, later promoted to sergeant, lieutenant, and uh, captain rank mm -hmm. when I retired from Cobb County. What year was that that you were uh, I did a short tour of duty with Cobb County, actually. Uh, I worked 12 years. 12 years? 12 years, time? yeah. The department just hit a growth spurt and a lot of rank. People made a lot of rank at that time. So. Well, that's amazing yeah. uh, advancement in rank in mm -hmm. 12 years. Right. When did yeah. you go to Reinhardt? Uh, well, after I left uh, Cobb County Police Department, I actually worked with Milford Smith Jewelry here in Ackworth for a period of time. Okay. And then I went to work as chief of police, city of Canton, uh -huh. and that's when I went to uh, went to Reinhardt for a criminal justice degree. Uh -huh. why, why did you stop after 12 years when you were obviously on an upward proje uh, trajectory? I, I think I just wanted to try something different okay. for a while. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, you were you were there at a time that Cobb County was growing by, right. by mm -hmm. yeah, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So uh, you uh, you worked for a little while, and then how how did it come about that you became police chief in uh, in Canton? Uh, I decided I wanted to get back into law enforcement. I heard they had an opening, and I applied for it, mm -hmm. and was selected. Well, uh, there. I 
I think we're missing something from this story okay. because there ha had to be something that obviously attracted everybody to you. Do you think? And don't don't be shy. Why, why do you, you must have been very good at what you were doing. I guess. Well, well, I tried to be. I tried to be good at it because, again, I want to go back to. I I had to be good at it. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't have any choice because of what I had gone through the the bad time mm -hmm. <laughs> while I was at North Cobb High School and looking back on the good times mm -hmm. at Ackworth and all those that I just uh, indicated a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to succeed. I wanted to be good at it. Mm -hmm. How long were you police chief in Canton? About, let's see, uh, from, what did you say, 84 until was it 90, 84 to 96. Okay. And you're going to ask me well, why I left there? <laughs> you're going to ask me why I left there? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, we're going to do that. Okay, I was... But I want to go back and talk about uh, why you were there, too. But talk about why you left. Okay, I was... Uh, everything was going great at Canton. I had no issues, no problems. And I got a phone call one day from an investigator with the Georgia Peace Officer Standards and Training Council. And he said they had two openings, two vacancies and uh, for investigators. Uh -huh. They wanted a police chief and they wanted someone who'd been a sheriff. Uh -huh. So I interviewed, I interviewed for that and I took the job as investigator with Post. Uh -huh. um, and I'll never forget when I left Canton, of course, the local newspaper wanted to know why are you leaving? And I said, it's very simple. It's a Monday through Friday job. I get a company car and no matter where I go or what I do as chief of police, I have 24 hours, seven day a week, 365 a year responsibility. Anything could happen. I could be anywhere in the world and something happen. Uh -huh. And I'm responsible, I'm liable, but uh, so post was, um, I think scheduling and uh, the work environment was just a lot better. Mm -hmm. What does it take to be a good police chief? Uh, a Wayne Denard type guy. Okay. Uh, he is a great example of mm -hmm. police chief, and I'm not saying that just because we're here in Ackworth. Mm -hmm. As uh, mm -hmm. post, I later became the director of investigations division, mm -hmm. and um, I had an opportunity to work with and see the 159 sheriff's offices in the state of Georgia and hundreds of law enforcement agencies. So I think being a, a good police chief, honesty and integrity, the things that you normally would, would hear, it, but, but you've got to be progressive too. Uh, it is changing so much. You've just really got to be on top of everything today. And it goes without saying, uh, education of course. Get as much education as training as you can. Stay on top of current events, how things are are really happening so fast out there. You got to stay on top of those. Mm -hmm. How do you stay community oriented as a police chief, or when you're supervising a department? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess one of the issues is, of course, in a small town, it's a lot easier, I right. guess, than in a big city. Yeah, but one of the issues is certainly uh, uh, a popu some of the population, at least, being alienated from police forces. Right. How do you how do you become part of the community? I guess. Well, I for me, it was easy at the time in the city of Canton. Um, uh, the first year I was there, there was a group that wanted a rally in town, and um, it was going to be very controversial. At that rally, they were on one side and the African-American community on the other side. And it really, really, uh, there was just a lot of shouting and yelling and threatening going mostly from the side that wanted to do the protesting. Uh -huh. And I noticed that there were about three members, adult and male members in the African-American community that were leaders, and they were calming their, the crowd down, mm -hmm. helping those people. 
So after that was over with, I went to the uh, city manager and the mayor, and I said, look, let's get a hold of these guys. One happened to be, I think he was a school teacher, and one uh, gentleman worked for General Motors. I said, let's get them together with some members of our public safety committee and some of our other business community leaders, business association, and let's just sit down and talk. Yeah. And that started it. And then it became, uh, we had no, no issues with the African-American community. Mm -hmm. But this outside element came in, and I think by us doing that, getting together, it, we realized we are one community, and we don't need outside influences, and we've all got to work together to, to make this community uh, better and mm -hmm. keep improving the community. So mm -hmm. you just have to uh, reach out uh, go to the business association and, and work with those folks, the newspaper, news media. Yeah. Of course, when at that time you were there, uh, Cherokee County was overwhelmingly white. Yes. And, yeah. and, uh, and uh, yeah. Canton, I assume, was pretty right. much the same. Wasn't yeah, it, it was. Um, so talk a little bit about... Um, uh, the peace officers, uh, the Georgia Peace Officer Standards and Training Council, uh, just exactly what it is and what you were doing for them and how long you did that. Okay, I uh, started there in 1996, and I'd only worked a few months, and when I got called to active duty through the Navy Reserve, and I thought that opportunity is over, <laughs> but anyway, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> no, I, I stayed on, and then uh, I came back and the director of investigations had taken a job with a private company. So I interviewed and became the director of investigations for POST, mm -hmm. Peace Officer Standards and Training Council. Now, mm -hmm. that is the agency, the state agency that licenses police officers. Mm -hmm. There is a governing board, the council members, who are appointed, uh, some by the governor, uh, some by virtue of, of law, by the position they hold, the director of GBI, those sorts of things. And uh, it, the best way I can tell you how POST operates is if anyone wants to be a police officer in Georgia, they go to a police agency. Mm -hmm. If they meet the hiring standards of that agency, they're hired. Mm -hmm. And then an application is sent to POST for certification, a license. A certification division would make sure that is in order. They get approval to go to the, the training academy for certification. Now, as I said, I was the director of investigations until I retired in 2014. Mm -hmm. And if you see on the news, for example, that a, a certified officer is gets in trouble, it could be an agency violation or a criminal charge or something like that, that officer can be the uh, subject of three separate and distinct investigations. Mm -hmm. One is the agency would do the internal affairs investigation to determine what happens to employment. If it's a criminal charge, somebody would do a criminal investigation to get them into the judicial system, and then POST would conduct an investigation to see what happens to their state license. So there's three separate distinct investigations. Mm -hmm. So in, in short order, that's what POST yeah. is and what they do. And of course, there's a training division that oversees the uh, academies and the courses that are taught in the academies. Mm -hmm. wow. And it sounds like you did that longer than you did anything. I did, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, that pretty much your career, but you also did some travel. Uh, you were telling me earlier before we got started about going to Israel, for Correct. instance. Correct, yeah. Talk about that. What, what were you, why did you go to Israel and what did you do there? At, at that time, uh, when I was chief at the city of Canton, there was a program through the uh, Georgia State University headed by Dr. Robbie Friedman of the Criminal Justice Department, mm -hmm. an exchange program with Israeli police where we would send delegations over there for training, they would send delegations here. Mm -hmm. And I was selected to go on the second delegation to Israel. I think we were there about 15 days training with the Israeli National Police. Mm -hmm. Great experience, as I told you earlier, I would go back today, uh -huh. if invited. Well, 
Now, you lived in England for a while, too. Yep. How did that come about? Thanks to the U.S. Navy, I lived in England. Oh, that was why you were yeah, I, I was, I was called to active duty, and I was stationed at Alconbury, which is about 75 miles north of London. Uh -huh. While I was over there, I lived in a flat, I bought a car, and traveled uh -huh. as much of England as I could. Uh, what years would that be? That was not, oh my goodness. Uh, I think about 1994, 1995. Oh, okay. I, but 1995, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, had that, that experience. Right um, <clears throat> after you left, oh, wait a minute. Uh, uh, that, that's right before you go to post, I guess. Oh, yes. I was chief at Canton when I went so to Israel. Chief from Canton. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you said you'd been to Japan also? Right, thanks to the Navy, went to Japan. Okay. And like a lot of military folks, uh, uh -huh. uh, went to Japan, military bases all over the U.S., uh -huh. uh, Navy bases, one Air Force base, by the way. Uh -huh. And uh, let's see, went to uh, Italy, up in the Adriatic on the uh, flagship for the 6th Fleet at the time. Uh -huh. So, uh, How long were you in the Navy Reserve? Uh, 16 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, let's see, something I guess we skipped over, you went to the FBI National Academy. I did. As well. When I was with Cobb County Police Department, I was selected to go to the FBI National Academy, uh -huh. which is a 12-week program at the Marine Corps Base, Quantico, Virginia. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so as I said earlier, I've had some adventures. That sounds like it. Uh, so n now you're living in uh, the Woodstock area of Cherokee County? Yes, uh, Bells Ferry Road, Hobgood Road, uh, uh, Wingate, Town Lake area, which is yeah. has a Woodstock address, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Ackworth. I'm Ackworth. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you how often do you yeah. come back to Ackworth? Oh, quite a bit. I have, I have uh, family that lives in the city of Ackworth. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got to admit, though, I haven't really done a lot in downtown Ackworth uh, as far as the uh, visitor center and things like that that I should. I'm overdue. Well, I was that. just going to ask you how Ackworth has changed over the years since you were growing oh, up. Oh, my goodness. Well, there's one photograph that we looked at earlier. <clears throat> it was made on Spring Street when we lived there. Mm -hmm. I'm standing with my sister. We're at the end of Spring Street, uh -huh. which, again, is right next to Crane Taxidermy. Uh -huh. There are subdivisions now, down through there now. And uh, in that picture, what interested me about that photograph is in the background, um, you could see Spring Street at that part on the day, it was dead end, it was dirt. And whoever owned the property across from where the photograph was made, it looked like farm. There are some outbuildings, and if memory serves me, I think they might have had some livestock there. So I've seen Ackworth go from, if you will, very rural, rural areas to... Uh, uh, what it is now it's just it, it's just changed so much but but you know what it's still Ackworth it's still there's still something about Ackworth for those of us who who were raised here and grew up here that that will never go away no matter what changes on Main Street or with the businesses but while I was here with Milford Smith Jewelry there was a period of time and one of your other interviewees I can't remember who it was recalled empty storefronts Mm -hmm. So I remember seeing those. Um, and you wonder, is Ackworth just going to go away? Mm -hmm. But obviously it hasn't and never will. Okay. So. I guess we should uh, mention Sue Brookshire Corbin in this thing. Yeah. Uh, somebody we interviewed earlier. Right. How are you related to her? Sue Corbin Brookshire, excuse me, Sue Brookshire Corbin is my first cousin. Her mother and my dad were brothers and sisters. And uh, uh, did you have much association with her when you were growing up? Yes, we did. Mostly family reunions and uh, some some church activities. We all mm -hmm. would attend the same churches. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it was mostly the, the big family reunions, and they were big. With a lot of. That's great. Well, um, uh, is there anything that you would like to add to the interview that we haven't talked about? Yes. Ask me about the caboose. The caboose. Okay. Okay. Uh, tell me about the caboose. Okay. 
when I was working with Milford Smith Jewelry, uh -huh. uh, I attended the business association meetings. Uh -huh. And if memory serves me, Pete Brumfield was the president of the association at the time. And this was in the late, uh, the mid to late eighties. So, Dr. Bill Sharpton, the optometrist on Main Street at the time, the discussion came up among the membership about the way things were going to grow, the things that were going to happen in Ackworth. So there were some really forward-looking people in that business association. Mm -hmm. and you can give them a lot of credit for things that have taken place in Ackworth over the years. But the discussion came up that we need a visitor center. And finally, Dr. Bill Sharpton, I'll never forget this, he said, well, you know, the railroads, they're getting rid of the caboose on the trains. Maybe we can get a caboose. Mm -hmm. And you know what they, do you remember the story about uh, hanging the bell on the cat? <laughs> okay. okay. Anyway, some people may remember that. Mm -hmm. I spoke up and I said, hey, I've got a friend who works with a railroad. Let me find out from him mm -hmm. what it takes to get a caboose. I called Bill, and he said, write a letter on business association letterhead to the headquarters, I think in Jacksonville, Florida at the time. Tell them your city would like to have a caboose. I wrote the letter. Now, what are we thinking? It's going to be two years before we get a caboose, right? And I was sitting in the jewelry store one day, and the phone rang, and it was Bill, and he said, this was, he said, your train's going to be there in two weeks. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> okay. This is only like a month after I'd written the letter. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do now? So now we had to get together and say, where do we put a caboose? We're thinking two years down the road, we got time. Mm -hmm. There was a gentleman by the name of Burn Max, Burn Maxwell who ran the travel center at 92 and 75. And at that time, their big sign had a, train logo a railroad mm -hmm. cross arm logo on it mm -hmm. and i talked to burn and i said is there any way you could put the train on your the, the caboose on your property until uh we find a place for it he called me back the next day he talked to his uh owners i guess and they said sure bring it on so then i said okay how do we move this thing where do we put it and they were going to put it on the siding that was just, um, well, it's gone now, but again, near Crane Taxidermy, there used to be an old mill there that some of your interviewees have talked about, Mac especially, I think. And there was a siding right there. So they were gonna put it on that siding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I said, okay, now we, it's gonna be on the siding, but how do we get it from there over to uh, the travel center? Well, the railroad said, well, we're going to supply the cross ties and the ballast, the rocks, the ballast, mm -hmm. and the rails, and along with the caboose. Okay, great, but how are we going to move it? And I really wish I could remember the name of the gentleman, the company who owned heavy equipment here in Ackworth, or just outside the city of Ackworth. I really apologize that I can't recall his name. He gets a lot of credit. I called him at no charge. When the time came, the railroad put down the, the little section of track over at the travel center, and this gentleman brought heavy equipment to the siding, lifted the caboose off, put it on a big trailer, took it over there, and put it on the tracks. But now there's another little side story here. We're thinking, okay, this caboose is going to be sitting on the siding down there. It's going to be... Uh, an attractive nuisance. How do we keep people from getting hurt? Mm -hmm. I call the Ackworth Police Department. <clears throat> I said, will you put some crime scene tape around that? And they did. <laughs> and I was in the jewelry store one day and this local gentleman walked in and he was talking about the caboose on the siding. And he said, have you heard anything about who got murdered on that caboose? And I said, do what? He said, yeah, there's crime scene tape around it. And he said, <laughs> word is that somebody got murdered on that caboose. That's and I, I said, no, let, let, let me tell you why it's there. And I have always thought that was funny. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Now, another funny story is that uh, one day I attended a, I think it was a Chamber of Commerce meeting, and I sat at the table with uh, some members of the Kennesaw Business Association, Mm -hmm. and they were talking, and one person said, well, maybe we can get a caboose. Maybe we can get the one that's on the siding up at Ackworth. And they didn't know it was ours. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but that belongs to the Ackworth Business Association, the city of Ackworth. And I could see they just kind of went, hmm, they were deflated. And so I have jokingly said that Kennesaw has lost two trains in their history. One, the general, and one is the caboose that Ackworth has got. So <laughs> there was no murder on the train, and uh, that's the history of how the caboose got here. Okay, so- Way to welcome people to Ackworth. <laughs> I hope it's been an attraction for everyone, yeah, and a, and they have I enjoyed never it. Never heard that story before. Right. That's great. Anything else? Uh, Nothing I can think of, uh, except in summary. Again, let me just say my appreciation to the culture and the city and the people of Ackworth from my early years. That again, and I know I'm repeating, but again, later on, when I just had had the time and I thought, okay, Brad, you've got to do better in life. And mm-hmm. that's your example. Mm-hmm. Ackworth, the people, the culture, mm-hmm. the friendships. Yeah. That's what you want to be like. That's what you want to do. Yeah. You can't let them down. You can't let your family down. Great. Great. Well, you've got a wedding ring on. You want to say anything about your family? Uh, family, I have, I have two sons, four grandsons. Mm-hmm. And super proud of all of them. They all have good work ethics. I have one son who is just really an accomplished. Uh, uh, he works in a machine shop, uh-huh. but the things they do, they build uh, things for satellite dishes and equipment. And just uh-huh. I'm just in awe of what he can do uh-huh. with machinery and his uh, mechanical skills. Now, my other son is a lieutenant with the Cobb County Police Department. I'm very proud of him. He has done some great things in his career. Mm-hmm. He's got more career behind him than he does in front of him. But he's doing great. He's doing great. And uh, my, uh, I, don't, I don't want to belabor this, but I want to go back to Spring Street and tell you sure. something, sure. if I may. Yeah. I think that's on Spring Street. That's where I learned to love airplanes and aviation. Oh, we didn't talk about that. Well, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going from one thing to the other, but uh-huh. thanks for allowing me to do that. I remember on Spring Street as just a little kid, I would hear an airplane, uh-huh. and I would run to see what kind of airplane it was. Now, at that time, Lockheed and Dobbins Air Force Base were really, really active. I have seen airplanes that you only read about in history books now, uh-huh. um, the bombers and the fighters and everything like that. And I just really, really was attracted to aviation. Uh-huh. And uh, later on, I, I, I'd always wanted to be a pilot, so I was able to get my pilot license. I, I got a pilot license. I got a glider license, and I glad I had a, I got a glider commercial license. So I've worked uh, part-time at some glider fields, giving rides. When I was in England, uh-huh. I joined a glider club over there and did some glider flying. And my wife now, she works. She's the customer service manager at the uh, Cherokee County Regional Airport in Ball Ground, oh, really? and she's a pilot. And my son, who's a, a lieutenant with Cobb County, he's a pilot. Great. So, well, tell me about the Civil Air Patrol. What, what did you do with them? Well, I was at Post mm-hmm. and uh, had a friend who we got acquainted in glider flying. He would be the tow pilot, and I would mm-hmm. be in the glider giving rides. He was a police officer here in Georgia also. And he called me one day, and he said, Brad, have you ever thought about Civil Air Patrol, and I said, no, not really. And at that time, he was uh, with the uh, uh, squadron in LJ. So he invited me up to a couple of meetings, and as a result of that, I joined the Civil Air Patrol, became the safety officer, uh, at the rank of, um, started out as a senior, then a lieutenant, and then a captain with the Civil Air Patrol. Yeah. And uh, got qualified in all three positions uh, in the Civil Air Patrol mission aircraft. It's a scanner, the back seat, observer right seat, uh, mission pilot left seat, and uh, did some civil, civil air patrol 
and I was a safety officer for this squadron for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I had an opportunity to do that. All right. Well, you've done a great many things, and I really thank you for the interview. Today. Sure. Well, like I said, I, life has been an adventure and continues to be so. Well, appreciate all that you do. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.